I'm Chris Richardson, and this is Not A Pipe Podcast. Thank you very much for joining me today on the penultimate episode of This Is Not A Pipe, Season 3. I'm really thrilled to be able to share with you my interview with Ebony Elizabeth Thomas. She's written a really fantastic book, I'm sure you've probably heard of it by now, called The Dark Fantastic Race and the Imagination from Harry Potter to the Hunger Games. Ebony is an associate professor in the Literacy, Culture, and International Educational Division at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. She's a former Detroit public school teacher and a National Academy of Education slash Spencer Foundation postdoctoral fellow. She has been doing some incredible work and is really starting to pick up steam after publishing The Dark Fantastic. I was really glad I could speak with her recently. This was recorded a few weeks ago about representation, fiction, the role of equality in publishing, and the imaginary world in which we base a lot of the real considerations, and of course, where the real world bleeds into quite a bit. If you want to see more about Ebony and her book recommendations, please check out tinapp.org. Be sure to follow the link in wherever it is that you found the podcast, and you can see what books she recommends, such as Afrofuturism, Black Comics, and a host of other really great resources. Ebony, thank you so much for speaking to me today. Let's get right into it and start with The Dark Fantastic. What is it that we're talking about and what is it that you set out to do in this book? The Dark Fantastic is a book that has incubated in my brain and in my heart and soul for the past 40 plus years. First, as a little girl growing up in Detroit, um, forever dreaming, head in the clouds, nose and glasses buried in a book. On to the late 90s when I was in undergrad and first discovering the social web and getting ensconced in early fandom communities and dealing with personhood and identity and sharing narrative there in that space. And then as a young teacher trying to find reads for my inner city kids um, who are a lot like me, but just a generation after, um, in some cases, just a half generation later, because I started teaching when I was quite young and wondering about their genre choices. Sometimes kids really didn't want to read fantasy and science fiction, especially back in those days. And then on to trying to publish my own fantasy stories and just trying to strike a balance and find a way to break into print in a publishing industry and in a creative writing landscape that didn't always see Black people or people of color, especially before the 2010s. So this is a book that had been cooking for quite a long time. And then finally, when I got to Penn, you know, got a golden ticket on the academic job market, I was finally in a space where I was the children's literature professor and able to write this as my tenure book. And I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to put it all on paper and to start theorizing some of the experiences that I had had during my entire literate life. Maybe we can start by defining it a little bit. The Dark Fantastic, I know that it's inspired in some ways by earlier works like Black to the Future. And I think there's uh, the world of black sci-fi and fantasy culture, Afrofuturism, and a number of other books that are related in scope. But you've chosen the idea of the Dark Fantastic as your central term. What, what does it mean and how does it relate to some other terms that you've come across? I wanted to write first about my experiences feeling excluded from the mainstream of science fiction and fantasy throughout a lifetime. There were a number of scholars who were already thinking through and theorizing Afrofuturism, which is a movement, an aesthetic, an entire mood. <laughs> and um, it's something that I participate in as a creative and as a fangirl. So, but I felt as if a lot of people were already um, working in that space. I'm thinking about Itasha Womack, who mm. wrote the book Afrofuturism, as well as Andre Carrington, Sami Shalk, and a number of other scholar friends um, had work in that area already that I drew upon and that I cited. And then there was also the notion of the Black fantastic. So thinking about fantastic flights that people of African descent 
engaged in beyond sort of, you know, Western traditions of speculative fiction and, you know, speculative storytelling. So there were already those works. I wanted to think through in the process of writing this book, I wanted to think through what was happening as a Black child reader or teen or young adult engaged in mainstream speculative narratives from page to screen. So what would that experience be like? So I knew that I, you know, felt and experienced certain things, but I wanted to trace a generation later what was happening in the mainstream speculative fiction, because everyone reads Harry Potter, reads the Hunger Games. And I felt that very often Black folks that raised questions about race in science fiction, fantasy, and comic were slammed with two, one of two things. First, what about Octavia? Or what about Samuel Delaney? You know, because those were two of our groundbreaking creatives in the area. Or we were directed to some of our creatives who were able to break through in subsequent generations. There were very few. You can count them. Zeta Elliott, who is an author and activist, actually keeps a listing of all of the middle grades and young adult science fiction and fantasy books published in the United States since 1970. And by 2000, we had only reached, I think, maybe 26, and that's really stretching what you include in the category. We finally reached 100 books, perhaps in 2018, which was informally dubbed the Year of Black Girl Fantasy because there were four major releases from the big six publishing houses. However, I'd like to point out that there are (laughs) 3,000 books published every year in the juvenile category, so in children's literature and in young adult fiction. So that was, I wanted to do um, some definition work. I wanted to do some theoretical and conceptual work. And I wanted to draw some boundaries around what we were talking about when we were talking about Afrofuturism, because I find that it's unhelpful to use it as an umbrella term when Mark Derry and Alondra Nelson and Itasha Womack and others who have been defining that space are speaking of something specific. And I think it's important for racial justice and social justice to be extremely specific about what we're um, defining. So hence the dark fantastic. That's the background. Um, Simply put, the dark fantastic is my term for the role that racial difference plays in our fantastically storied imaginations. The first imaginative tales that we receive are in early childhood. And so this is a site that I argued was not examined enough for the formation of the collective imagination. That's what I wanted to do. No, that's perfect. And that leads exactly into what I wanted to ask you about, which is what makes the questions that you raise, what makes them so important? In other words, why bother thinking about children's literature, young adult literature, and the role of race, the kinds of protagonists and antagonists that are present? And like, why count how many protagonists or or young people are given or or have access to these kinds of books? What makes that so important? Wow, that's a really big question. (laughs) Children's literature is such an important site for how young people understand the world around them. So we receive messages from sources that tend to be examined by scholars and society. So everyone knows that children learn things from their families. So the kind of family that a kid grows up in or or neighborhood or home matters deeply Mm -hmm. for their lived experiences and their social outcomes. So that is one area that much has been said about. Certainly school and education is another area that kids um, learn about self and society and the world around them, you know, through. So through your education, you're constantly receiving messages about who you are, who others are, and who people are around you in the world. So you're immersed in home, community, family, neighborhood. The media is also another source that kids receive messages from. So is the internet. But children's books, 
mm-hmm. huge, absolutely huge. They're huge because they're used in schools. They are found in homes, whether or not they're actual physical books, audio books, or transmediated or um, adaptations of narratives that appear on screen. They also tend not to be reviewed by society very much. So we are reading some of the same children's books that people were reading 100 years ago during a very different time. Mm -hmm. We haven't really examined what that does or the kinds of beliefs people had 100 years ago or 50 years ago that may or may not apply today. And Everyone who is producing stories for young people, just like I was immersed in the environment of the 1980s and 1990s and all the books that, you know, were on the shelf that were published before that time. So are all of the people producing these stories for young people today. So there are just so many unexplored um, and unanswered questions that raises And so that's why I'm very passionate about not only the dark fantastic, but about thinking through the role of racial difference in children's literature and media, because I think that this is an area where work can be done to help us understand why we are where we are in 2020. Yeah. Well, and let's get to some of the examples that you use in the book. We have, I mean, a number of transmedia texts, things that in some cases like Harry Potter started off as books, very popular, and then really quickly grew to collect fan fiction, films, of course, and then communities, even theme parks now. I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you chose your your main objects of study and how they reveal things that you were looking for. I really wanted to be able to follow the journey of marginalized Black girl characters from um, page to screen. Because when I was in fan communities, I noticed that, first of all, most of the largest fandoms tended to feature um, white protagonists, right? So yes, we had work by Octavia Butler, Virginia Hamilton, mm-hmm. Tanana Reeve Du, other Black creatives during the 90s and 2000s. However, most of the buzz, most of the marketing, merchandising, and fan cultural push was around large narratives that tended to be much more traditional. And so because a lot of the early 2000s stories for young people, youth and young adults, included a character of color. So um, in these cases, a little black girl. I wanted to look at each of those stories from page to screen from the black character's perspective. I wanted to do that for a few reasons. First, because I wanted to think about the text itself and what might have gone into the creation of that character. The characters that I talk about um, had a different genesis. So they came from different sources. I wanted to think about what happened to the character as uh, the story moved from page to screen. And I wanted to trace how fans were responding to the presence of that character in the narrative online, in, you know, discussions, sometimes through fan fiction. Did they respond negatively? Did they respond positively? Were they able to suspend disbelief that there was a Black girl character in the story? And I think finally, I chose these stories because they have to be books I cared about. So um, some people question whether or not I was cherry picking. So, you know, as if I chose the four uh, stories that uniquely positioned Black girl characters in negative ways. like, And there were a plethora of other stories that I didn't choose <laughs> where there were Black girls thriving and surviving and uh, all that other good stuff. I did send this book to senior scholars in children's literature and in science fiction and fantasy to, you know, throughout the writing of it to see whether or not I was indeed cherry picking or, you know, if I was just cooking up some strange theory or this is just my imagination. However, um, they said, no, I think that there um, might be something there. And then certainly I have heard from scholars, especially um, emerging scholars and grad students from all over the world who have really enthusiastically responded to having 
some conceptual framework for thinking about what happens in these tales, not just in the text itself or on the screen itself, but thinking about the entire transactional experience that happens among texts and creatives and audiences. Yeah, well, maybe you could say a little bit about the the cycle that you introduced early on, right? It's sort of a, a five-part cycle that you find in, I guess, virtually all dark, fantastic tales. Yeah, maybe you could explain a little bit about that uh, for people who haven't read the book. I'd be more than happy to. So in retrospect, I was thinking, well, maybe there is another stage I could have introduced, but I really wanted to simplify it. I think it's because of my position as faculty in education. So when you're working in education, so you're training teachers and librarians and reading specialists, but you also do a lot of public facing work. So uh, one hat I wear is at a children's literature critic. So um, I've been invited to write reviews. Another role that I have is as someone who gives workshops to schools and libraries and communities. So um, I've learned that if you make it too academically dense, then not only do people not know what you're talking about, um, it's sometimes, you know, it's counterproductive. So I only have five stages in my uh, dark face fantastic theory. So for the first stage in the dark fantastic cycle is spectacle because the presence of a black character in science fiction and fantasy um, before the 2010s, and I have questions about what has happened over the past 10 years, but before a few years ago, the very presence of a black character in that mainstream speculative narrative made everybody sort of go, whoa, look, there's a Black person, you know, and we have evidence for that all over, um, not only the, the social web, but also all throughout the literature. Um, a friend of mine, Debbie Reese, the curator of American Indians and Children's Literature and the co-author and of um, An Indigenous People's History of the United States for Young People, had this article that I teach called Look Ma, It's a TV Indian. And that was a statement that her daughter <laughs> made about sort of the flat kind of character that you get in mainstream media when it comes to marginalized or minoritized folks. So I think about that all the time when I think about some of the reaction to Rue in The Hunger Games being Black once people saw Amanda Stenberg was cast or this notion of Noma Dumuzweni playing the adult Hermione in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. So that's st step one. Step two is hesitation. What the spectacle makes the reader or audience um, who's been carefully taught through the whole of Western speculative fiction that Black folks don't belong there, it causes that reader or viewer or audience member to hesitate. When I was a new master's student 20 years ago, I remember reading Todorov's um, The Fantastic, which was all about how the genre of the fantastic was structured. And so he theorizes the uncanny. He does a lot of important work, which is why that book has been cited so much. And of course, the dark fantastic is a riff off what he did there. But he said that the spirit of the fantastic was hesitation. Quote, I nearly reached the point of believing, end quote. And so I really wanted to think through this idea of nearly reaching the point of belief. So like what would make someone reject the presence of a Black person in that role? And so that was what I found when I looked at how people were responding to the role. I even found it in the case of BBC uh, Merlin's Gwen, where I marked, and it's in the book, a point of hesitation where the screenwriter broke the fourth wall and said, I almost wouldn't believe it or something like that. The exact quotes in the book, like where they kind of wink and nod to the audience because you have King Arthur about to fall in love with a black woman who's playing Guinevere. And so 
that um, showrunner, Julian Murphy, was signaling to the audience, like, yeah, mm -hmm, this is weird, or wow, you know, <laughs> like they break the fourth wall in this really weird way that absolutely doesn't happen in the rest of the series. And so, so that's stage two. So it makes the reader hesitate. So the hesitation has to be resolved because otherwise you're just going to be you, the story, you know, the audience is going to just stop. Like, okay, that's not right. I no longer believe the tale or I'm taken out of the tale. How do you resolve the presence of the dark other in a tale like that? Well, you enact violence. That's stage three. You enact violence on that character. So usually it's death, you know, usually kill the person. Um, so there's both actual death, you know, you kill the black person out of place. And, you know, we're speaking um, a few days since um, the death of Ahmaud Arbery went viral. So a black person out of place not only gets removed in real life, they need to be removed in the story. And stories devise all kinds of ways of doing this. So um, not only actual death, like, you know, usually, you know, the character gets killed off. Um, there's also social death, you know, because the presence of that Black person is threatening. We see it on every level of society. We see it, you know, not only in these highly televised, traumatic killings, of, you know, Black folks, mainly men. We also see it in ways that Black people in every aspect of society end up suffering from social death, which is uh, one of the central planks of Afro-pessimism, you know, where, you know, well, you're socially dead or, you know, we're living somewhere between death and life. But then not only are, do we have to die we can't die. And I totally took that from Toni Morrison's work, especially her amazing set of essays, Playing in the Dark. She talked about this 25 years ago, saying that the Africanist other haunts all of U.S. literature. And I would add to that, and um, she also signals to this, you know, indigenous and native and First Nations folk. So we are haunted by these atrocities, thinking of Ursula K. Le Guin's um, Those Who Walk Away from Omelas. You know, we are haunted by it. Our nation's foundations are built upon this. So, yeah, you got to get rid of, you know, the dark other in the story. But nonetheless, the presence, the fact that they're there, they were there, still nonetheless haunts the tale. You know, you go through those four steps of that cycle and the cycle is only broken if you can emancipate the character, which means that you are writing against the whole of Western speculative narrative. It's so tough to do. And it's why whenever creatives of my generation were trying to break in, we were expected to be a genius like Octavia Butler or Nora Jemison or Peter Jelly Clark or any of the people who are actually breaking through because it takes a ton of, you have to, it's it's like you have to rethink everything you know. It's a radical subversive act. So that's the dark fantastic. As you said, it's sort of simple as five steps, but also it's very deep and nuanced for anyone who's read your book knows as you start to apply those things. So maybe we could start with uh, The Hunger Games just as an example. It's your first chapter uh, when you analyze it and apply it. I knew vaguely about the controversy of having this black actor or mixed race actor uh, who played the character in, in the Hunger Games. But what exactly happened and how does that fit within the cycle, maybe you could say? So one of the um, saddest stories within the Hunger Game, Hunger Games Legendarium is the story of Rue, the tribute from District 11. She is a little black girl, um, about 12 years old. And I'm hoping that most of your readers are familiar with the story of the Hunger Games. So I'm sure at um, least uh, cursory knowledge. I mean, I, I, yeah, I read those okay. books when they came out, but um, okay, great. I'm sure most people have at least seen the ads, if not the films. OK, great. So, you know, this is a world where children are selected from different parts of this dystopian U.S. to participate in a fight to the death. So it's sort of this stylized gladiatorial fight to the death that is televised. Suzanne Collins said at the time that she wrote the books that she was inspired by both 
her father's tales of the Vietnam War, um, his experiences during war. And then in the early 2000s, she said she would flip the channels and the television was either showing images of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and reality TV. So reality. Reality TV really took off in the early 2000s, as we all know. Hmm. So the Hunger Games, the one district that seemed to have, even in the book, black tributes was District 11, which I speculated might be the U.S. South, right? So mm -hmm. Rue and Thresh are uh, described as being dark skinned in the um, story. And Rue becomes a critical friend and ally of protagonist Katniss Everdeen in the first book. Much of what Katniss becomes in the subsequent story is because of her association with Rue, who dies early on in the games. The original Mockingjay, so the call, all the bird imagery associated with that particular bird symbol, it's all initially associated with Rue. And so it took me a year to write that chapter, not only because I was doing other things, the education tenure track required that mm -hmm. I write articles along with the, with the book, but also just because it was very painful to slow the text down mm -hmm. and to go word by word, page by page, and just focus on Rue's story. And what I found was Rue became this sacrificial bird or this symbolic sacrifice for all of the Hunger Games. Two of my colleagues, while I was in the process of writing The Dark Fantastic, published an article about Rue being the real Mockingjay of the Hunger Games. And I, of course, cite them mm -hmm. in it. So she's the real Mockingjay, you know, the call kind from Rue. She's perched in trees like a bird. There's so much bird symbolism throughout the story that hails deeply U.S. literature from, um, I wrote the yellow, about the yellow rose of Texas um, mm -hmm. and birds, you know, like I wrote about, like there was just so much in that story when you slowed it down, but it's really quite sad because it is the case that this little black girl sacrifices herself and then upon her sacrifice, Katniss's heroism is built. And it's not that Katniss was intending for Rue to die. She's quite sad about it in initially. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how her heroism is built, um, built through everything that Rue does. And so I, you know, and I'm not the only scholar who's observed that one of my colleagues in film studies, I think, likened her to uh, the flayed one, which is, I'm not sure that I would have made that connection, but, you know, a Mesoamerican, you know, sacrificial le legend where, you know, someone is, takes on the, you know, <laughs> literally the skin of another. And certainly that's not overstated because we see it in U.S. life and in letters mm -hmm. and in popular culture, we see that sort of thing happen over and over and over again. If anything, I didn't go far enough. But that is sort of the story that I'm telling mm -hmm. in the Lamentations of a Mockingjay, which is the Rue chapter. And I was especially, I guess, sort of taken aback because I didn't realize that until reading your book that there was like a, a collection of tweets, people responding to the fact that Rue is black in the film. I just, I, I still kind of, it boggles me that people could like write tweets uh, of anger, but maybe you can say a little bit about, about that and also how it might fit into this thing that you're looking for throughout the book. Oh, sure. It's really difficult to be Black in digital age fandom. It always has been. I mean, I managed to get through Harry Potter fandom during the post-racial 2000s. I was naive enough to believe back in 2000, so my goodness, 20 years ago this summer, that, oh my gosh, social media will change everything. We didn't even have social media as a term. So this was just online fandom will change everything because mm -hmm. no one can see who you are. Because back in those days, all we had were text chats and mm -hmm. blogs and 
I mean, gosh, AOL Messenger, Yahoo Messenger, AIM, you know, so you weren't seeing people's faces. Mm -hmm. And I thought that we would, this would bring us into a golden age of equity and inclusion. And actually, that's not what happened. (laughs) It just became another reenactment of the drama of racial difference that we see in offline life. Uh And so I was not, I was shocked. I shouldn't say I was shocked. I was dismayed and disappointed Mm -hmm. to see that so many young people um, born long after the civil rights movement, you know, like 20, 30 years after all that work had been done, choosing actively choosing to not say, okay, yeah, that's a black girl, but just, it was an affront that this little girl who was not even the main character, because heaven forbid Mm -hmm. if Katniss had shown up as black, right? That her very presence was an affront to some. Now, some critics have said, well, Ebony, weren't you cherry picking? This is a minority of people who have, you know, like who said that. So you're just finding all the racist stuff. Mm -hmm. But my question is this, why should that exist at all? Like, why would that be the most logical response, viewer and reader response to the presence of that Black girl? And they have no answer for that. Yeah. Like, why would anyone respond? Yeah, I mean, that was what was shocking to me is that even if it is minority of readers, it's still a, it seemed a fairly large number of people, like in general, that just that felt like they, yeah, were affronted by the fact that this character was portrayed by a person of color. And, but I mean, why, like, I know you can't necessarily say why it was that they felt like that, but why do these discourses continue, at least uh, in your reading of things? I really think it's because of a deep refusal to acknowledge the real work that children's literature and media, you know, do in the culture. I don't think we really acknowledge the fact that if a kid or a teenager has only ever seen white characters in the innocent little sister role from the time they're first introduced to stories until Mm -hmm. they pick up the Hunger Games, and they form in their minds and imaginations what Rue would look like in their tweens or teens. And then when the story is adapted, all you, you know, you see this black girl, then yes, you may think, you know, wow, that's just politically correct. She wasn't black in my imagination. That's because there aren't that many Rue-like characters in mainstream children's literature, which is why I do the work I do, by the way, because I sometimes get the question, well, why focus on this bad stuff? Why didn't you focus on highlighting the wonderful work that Black creatives, so authors, illustrators, Mm -hmm. or authors and illustrators of African descent do? And I said, well, because my friends, uh, many of, you know, I know many, many authors and illustrators and count them as many of them as personal friends. The challenge is that I don't think that the people who are screaming about Rue being Black, I don't think they read any of that stuff except for outside of Black History Month. So the problem, I, as I see it, it's not that I'm trying to harangue about whiteness all the time. It is the case that this literature and these you know, television and film narratives teach people how to treat us. So if they're being fed a steady diet of, you know, these characters are mostly white and here is one character of color so that we can't be called racist and they're pretty much wallpaper flat, they only serve um, the narrative, they don't have any agency, then when they finally do get a story from the perspective of a character of color, then it's going to seem jarring because all of a sudden they're decentered. And I do think that This is one of many things that helps to construct our society to be the way that it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you could say a little bit about your approach, because uh, you've alluded to it already about how you've asked questions from a point of view that wasn't necessarily the uh, central protagonist, but a side character or or a character that's not central in the story, perhaps, but represents uh, a minority or a person of color, and asking or thinking about the story from their perspective, highlighting new ways to approach the overall discourse surrounding it. I mean, one of the things that struck me as so obvious once you said it, but of course, I never thought of it myself, was in Harry Potter, how is it that 
black people who were magical or who had magic powers, like the the witches and uh, and characters in Harry Potter, how would they have been enslaved? Like, why didn't they just use their magic? That doesn't make any sense. But I don't think a lot of people were thinking that when they found portrayed either in the book or in the in the films, people of color who were who were clearly part of a, a history of uh slavery if they were in america or in, in britain but also yeah in that world it doesn't really make sense which is you know all it takes is asking a question from a different point of view of the main protagonist so maybe you could say a little bit about the the idea of approaching the stories from the way that you did i really got that from my fan experiences so um all right, so you're going to get a story that is not in the Dark Fantastic because I was encouraged by <laughs> editors bonus feature. and senior scholars right, to cut it out of the Dark Fantastic. So the one time in my life that I'd been a popular mean girl was during my time <laughs> in Harry Potter fandom. So I, was one of, I wasn't a mean girl, although I'm sure some people listening might be to differ. So <laughs> I ended up being one of the early uh, adopters of the social web, you know, nerdiness, social awkwardness. And so I found a group called Harry Potter for Grown Ups by June 2000. So I was in sort of Harry Potter. First, I found uh, fan fiction quite early. And I don't know like whether or not I'm trying to remember if I found fan fiction before Harry Potter fandom. My first fandom was the Anne of Green Gables kindred spirits listserv of all things, because <laughs> I, I love that story growing up, especially the CBC version that Kevin Sullivan did. So um, I joined that list in 1997 and did some fanish stuff around that, wrote a little fan fiction. Those were my first fix. And then by 2000, when Potter mania struck, I was teaching fifth grade. Um, I was 22 years old. My dad had died. Um, the man I'd fallen in love with was an acting right. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, what do you do? It's like, you know, do you drown yourself in drink? Um, no, you um, <laughs> join Harry Potter fandom <laughs> when first getting off the ground. I know. I remember telling my students this story maybe 10 years later, and they said, you mean to tell me, Dr. Thomas, that while we were, you know, partying it up and living it up in our 20s, you were online in all this fandom drama? And I was like, yeah. So anyway, here is where it gets relevant. I remember really shipping a couple that didn't happen hard. Like I really wanted this particular couple to end up. Now these are, you know, kid narratives, but we we knew that Rowling was going to tell the whole story from childhood to adulthood. So we were all projecting where all of these characters were going to land at the end of the story, right? Because mm -hmm. we've read fantasy all our lives. I mean, most of us grew up on Tolkien. So we were, we knew what was going to happen, you know, at the very end when, you know, Aragorn becomes, you know, the king and all is well and Sauron is defeated. So we were waiting for that. So anyway, long story short, um, I wanted to write a tale because I was involved in some shipping wars of all things. Shipping is called, is, is short for relationshiping. It was invented in Star Trek fandom when some viewers, mostly women, um, decided that Kirk and Spock were really a couple, right? Mm -hmm. And so 40 years later, we were having wars over who all the protagonists in Harry Potter would end up with. And so as part of a ship war argument, I wanted to show what Hermione and Ron's marriage might look like. 10 years like down the road, like when they were in their late 20s. And so I wrote this sort of soap opera parody called Trouble in Paradise. The challenge, Chris, was that I am Black. And so at the time, I couldn't have imagined myself into Hermione's perspective. And mm -hmm. I say that in The Dark Fantastic, right? And so what I did was I did something that later I watched young people do and that my colleague Amy Storniaiolo and I came up with a major theory of restoring how people do this. I basically turned the wheel that is in my book and I just decided, okay, I'm going to restore the perspective. I'm going to tell the story of how bad this marriage would be, but I'm going to tell it from the point of view of the one Black character, Angelina. And so I, you know, I didn't imagine a Black Hermione. I'm not a millennial. I hadn't seen any Black girls <laughs> in roles like Hermione's ever. Like from even having grown up with Virginia Hamilton and some of these amazing children's authors, I hadn't seen anything like Hermione. I knew she was white. So I told the story through Angelina's eyes. So she was, I assumed Angelina was going to marry 
a Weasley twin. You know, I didn't realize what would happen with Fred. And so taking myself into that space more than 20 years ago, my God, I started writing that story, you know, in 2000. I told this story and it went viral. And uh, later I was accused of plagiarism because I had Angelina tell her daughter the story of the people could fly. And um, they said that I didn't attribute it, but I was just thinking, well, isn't that indicative of whiteness? No, I didn't invent the people could fly. Mm. And I was deeply hurt that anybody would think I would steal Virginia Hamilton's words. She was so much a part of my childhood that I just assumed that everybody had read it. So it wasn't like I was telling that as the main story. Angelina used the people could fly to explain why Black magical people actually were caught up in the wizarding world with Anglo names, which made no sense. But there's so much of Western speculative fiction that when you really hold it up to a microscope, doesn't make that much sense from Mm -hmm. a real world perspective. But unless you're a black reader on the margins, you know, you don't really, it's like, oh, cool. You know, we're all good here. There's one of each, you know, there's a black girl, a black boy uh, character who is Asian, um, East Asian, because, you know, other colleagues have talked about Cho Chang. Um, there's the uh, Patil twins. And so, yeah, so a mainstream reader is going to go, OK, whatever. But I was wondering, I was like, well, why is she Angelina Johnson? Like, why would anybody go through chattel slavery if, um, you know, and I said, well, maybe she could be of, you know, just continental African descent or but there was a story there, right? Like, you can't just do that mm-hmm. and not tell the story. So that was why I did I did restoring more than a decade before I theorized it with my colleague a decade and a half so yeah yeah I mean and it's such an interesting story that you tell about both your experience but also the the fandom more generally but yeah how how would you well, would you encourage people to do that, the, to restory, and in what ways might you encourage that? I'm especially interested if uh, if you think that there's sort of particular academic possibilities there that maybe are untapped or not as explored as they could be. Well, um, a word of caution. Some of my students and some of my colleagues' students have spoken back to me about that last chapter, um, which they felt didn't go far enough because they warned of the dangers of appropriation. So they said, well... Ebony or Dr. Thomas, it's just not that simple because what if someone restories Angelina's perspective or a Black Hermione's perspective and makes her out to be racist or Mm. is culturally insensitive? And I honestly hadn't seen, I hadn't thought about that part of it. I should have thought about that part of it. But the fact of the matter is there are so few Black characters in mainstream fandoms. And out of the ones that we have, generally there are Black fans writing those characters or someone who has a reason to Mm. write from the Black character's perspective. You don't see that quite as much. Now, where it could be um, an issue is when you think about gender and sexuality, because we do have race bend, um, beyond race bending, there's gender bending, queer bending, and slash Mm -hmm. in fandom. So they've given me a lot to think about. However, I am pleased to see that there are other up-and-coming scholars who have taken up that restoring theory and they have made it their own. They have actually started to conduct some research to see what happens when you invite kids to um, retell a story. And so one of my own students, Josh Coleman's doing that work, new graduate from the University of Georgia, Stephanie Tolliver is doing that work. And there are just a number of other people who are taking it up. And that's a good thing, because as I note at the beginning of The Dark Fantastic, and certainly at the very end, I just felt that we needed to open up a conversation. Some of this conversation had been happening in various spaces, you know, from science fiction and fantasy theory to children's and young adult literature. But I wanted to pull all the threads together in a way that I hoped would be useful for folks from various disciplines. And I wanted to write something that was academic, but still light enough for general audiences to read. And I'm very pleased that I think that um, I accomplished that goal here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as I, as I was saying before to you, I've only heard good things. I mean, highly recommended from a number of different people, like some doing fan studies, uh, some doing critical race theory and, and other 
areas. Um, I mean, the book speaks to a number of different things that people are getting out of it. I'm wondering if you see if you see places, I guess, where people can build on your work. Like, I'm curious if if you could, uh, you know, push people in certain directions after reading this, like maybe encourage them to think about a few things, whether that's different stories, different franchises, or whether it's different approaches. Where would you like to see people who have read your book go in their scholarship? Well, I'm so thrilled because so much of that is already happening, and mm-hmm. I'm I'm just so excited about where we're going next. So, um, at the very end of the book, I point to where we need to go, and um, thinking about Terra Incognita, you know, from the dark fantastic to the black fantastic. So, thinking about all of the people who are doing good work in young adult fiction and science science fiction and fantasy. We're getting shows like Black Lightning and uh, Mm -hmm. See You Yesterday and Fast Color. Um, Certainly Black Panther has been this juggernaut, although, you know, it is attached to the larger Marvel Cinematic Universe. And there's been so much that's been greenlit, that's on the horizon. We're finally going to get some great adaptations of Octavia Butler's work. I'm looking forward to seeing N.K. Jemison's work on the screen because the Broken Earth trilogy was certainly the best science fiction hmm. um, slash fantasy or the best, it's fantasy, um, that I've read I mean, in 20 years, if ever. I mean, I've never read anything that good. Um, I So I'm very cautiously hopeful for um, the future, but I do have a word of caution for those who think, well, we're getting some Black artistic production in the speculative, because mm-hmm. um, we've always been doing this work, but main, you know, in the mainstream, we're starting to get mainstream funding for some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Every so often in the United States and in other Western countries, the Negro comes into vogue, <laughs> to quote my ancestors. So, you know, I was came of age in the 90s when we had so many Black sitcoms. There was an African-American literary renaissance. And so that inspired me as a teenager and an undergrad to try to write my own stories. And then I emerged into adulthood and the absolute post-racial dumpster fire of the 2000s, where all of the Black folks disappeared from um, TV, except for in secondary roles, where we had to wait until um, the early 2010s to get our first Black woman helming a primetime drama, you know, Olivia Pope in Scandal, played mm-hmm. wonderfully by Kerry Washington. So I am not confident that in this country we will see unfettered progress. I mean, I want to. I used to when I was younger, but, you know, recent events have turned me quite cynical. Like, I tend to like to be optimistic, and I ended the Dark Fantastic, tried to end it on an optimistic note. But, Chris, I'm just not sure where we're going from here. And <laughs> yeah, I, have I don't blame you, yeah. Audiences, yeah. Yeah, I've been asking audiences, is this a moment? Is this a movement? Or is this lasting change? Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure that anything in our collective history points to um, the latter, unfortunately, most unfortunately. I wish it were different. That's why I do this work. Well, yeah. And I, I mean, I think it's inspiring in different ways for different people. So creators might see things that academics don't and vice versa uh, with your book. But I think there's also, as you said, there's some challenges at the very least ahead, right? After the civil rights movement, there's after people born after the civil rights movement. So people who uh, had never seen certain things that earlier generations did would respond to something like a black character in the Hunger Games in the ways that they did, even if it is a minority of the population, uh, although a very vocal minority, it seems, that uh, may be getting louder in recent years, which is also, I think, why a lot of us are getting a little bit pessimistic in what we're hearing. What are the things that, to watch out for and maybe to push in our way if we want to support something more than just a, a flash in the pan. I mean, as you said, doing things that are very tokenistic are obviously things that wouldn't necessarily help continue this movement. So what are what are some things that you would hope that people are doing, whether that's creatives or scholars? And what are some pitfalls that we might run into? 
I think that we need to build and grow an anti-racist audience. So that means that we need to make an environment where a kid who is white will be as likely to pick up a book uh, with a main character who is not white as they are to pick up, you know, an um, own voices book or a book um, that is a mirror to mm-hmm. quote Dr. Rudin Sims Bishop. So we need that. We need straight folks to read LGBTQ literature. We need people in the United States to read literature by folks who do not reside in the U.S. or the West, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We need, mm-hmm. I am hopeful about the potential of story to change people's perspectives and their um, lives. Um, and um, I do think that that is a glimmer of hope. If we can change the storied environment that young people grow up in and come of age in, I think we'll begin to see lasting change. But that's going to require folks giving up spotlights and mics and, uh, you know, it, it's going to require a sharing of space that unfortunately, most unfortunately, we just haven't seen much of. Like, you know, it requires that, OK, so maybe I will, you know, like instead of me speaking for uh, folks of color or centering myself here, I'm going to publish or I'm going to produce something that is by a creative color. I'm going to make sure that they get the spotlight for something that's other uh, than a black pain narrative. Those narratives are important because certainly the story has been pain, you know, so that's number one. Number two is something that has been developing recently during the pandemic. I really need purported white allies to stop forcing black creators and scholars to do all the work. Hmm. So we are also held to an impossible standard. So what will happen is in order to deflect responsibility for um, anti-racism and social justice, then the black creative or scholars work will be over scrutinized and held to an impossible standard. Meanwhile, we had a whole game of thrones (laughs) thrown on our television sets, crashed a hundred million dollars thrown into the ground. And for what those guys are going to work again, they're going to eat again. They will be fine. If a black creative Mm. scholar or a professional makes one misstep, they're canceled forever. They will never work again. They will never, you know, we won't consider them for anything else. And so we need to find ways to humanize the folks behind the scenes. And I think that we'll be able to gain some kind of traction. Right now, um, Black folks are just held to an impossible standard of perfection. And then when we fail it, for not attending to A through Z, um, then um, we're canceled, books and shows or films are held up to campaigns. And the, the fact that that is a tactic, a protest tactic that Black folks have use throughout um, U.S. history, the boycott. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not saying we're always going to be right, but the problem here is the asymmetry of power, right? So it's different when you're holding someone who is marginalized to a standard that you're not holding. So it's like, you should not have to be Octavia Butler in order to publish pulp science fiction or fantasy. That wasn't, I mean, like that was the bar in the 2000s. Like you had to be Octavia and, you know, there were people who cleared that bar. I mean, Nora Jemison is just that good. Nettie Okorafor is just that good. But where is all of our midlist stuff? Where's all our pulp fiction? Why can't we be silly for a change in the speculative? So those are my recommendations. Um, You know, real allyship, Uh, means sharing space and humanizing creators and really working on building an anti-racist audience who is going to, I'm not saying you can't read um, Tolkien, I certainly do, Mm -hmm. uh, but that you'll be just as likely to pick up um, The Broken Earth or The Bells by Danielle Clayton 
or, um, you know, Tomi Adeyemi's Children of Blood and Bone, and you will enjoy it as much and you'll participate in both fandoms. That's when I'll know there has been real change. Yeah, no, and I think that's an important statement in, in a lot of ways. I'm wondering, like, the way that you describe that, at least the way I hear it, is that that's when we'll know, and therefore that's, you know, sometime in the future, and hopefully that will be very organic. It, it won't feel like people are making very, very conscious choices. They're just, you know, they happen to be reading literature that's by a host of different people and different perspectives. Yeah. Is there a way to to encourage that without seeming forced, I guess. I can just imagine the pushback and the reactionary movement to say, you know, this is too politically correct. And, you know, we've, we've seen this in politics where people now political correctness is, is a term that is used to vilify people. But yeah, is there a way that you see us moving towards that future in a way that makes it seem organic or at least doesn't make it seem forced? Hmm. So here's the thing. Black folks have been working on this stuff for 400 years. I mean, we were working for it even when we were in chains. We just need, we, I mean, most of us are just fresh out. Like we are doing everything mm. that we can in every field that we can, because in order to do our work, like I probably would have ended up writing about Tove Jansen or Lucy Maud Montgomery. Actually, one of my early papers was on her. Um, if, there weren't this other imperative in children's and young adult literature. We are working our butts off. We're mm -hmm. working ourselves into early grades. We need white folks to do, you know, to do some of this work mm -hmm. and to do it in ways that are not appropriative, that are not, you know, um, ways to exploit or to make money. So those steps, there, there has to be a willingness. We have done everything. We've literally done everything. There's like, I think where at least Black America, I can speak for, you know, what I'm hearing mm -hmm. and what I'm feeling and what we are experiencing. We're just, we're flat out. We can't, so we're, you know, dying disproportionately from a pandemic. We're still dealing with you know, just random violence, not even police, just not even just police brutality, you know, random violence that is just seen as quotidian. It's like, you know, yeah. that's just how America is. And then we're being, you know, we're, you know, we face all kinds of things at work and in daily life. And then we're saying, OK, so now make white folks, which is the bulk of the audience, or make people who aren't black care about you or humanize you or share space with you. And we've tried everything. We've tried love. We've tried anger. We've tried Jeremiah's. We've tried books like you know, <laughs> mine, which, you know, is one of like many, many thousands of, of books. And I just don't know. I think at this point it is, it's going to require white folks to figure it out or to figure out how they are going to, or if, you know, power will be, because really it's at the heart of it, power. Like people are afraid mm -hmm. of sharing because sharing feels like if you share space on a bookshelf, if you share space in a television guide, it feels like you're besieged. Like even like a couple of black shows or, you know, a number, a range of black authors winning, like maybe there's a year where five black people win a Pulitzer like this year, you know, then, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. they want to take, And so I think that deep down and again, because I'm not part of the group, it has to be in group work. There's this fear of retaliation that some way and somehow the past 500 years, the past half millennium that the rest of us are going to retaliate against all of it. And I think most of us, like, that's not, you know, maybe sure we're, you know, billions of people, you know, there's a few of us, but really, I just think that it's going to take really smart, thoughtful, anti-racist work. And that begins with actually existing an authentic community with folks of color. And that's so rare, like people opening up and sharing their lives across racial and ethnic differences. We still don't have that in this country. We're still deeply, deeply segregated. We're still deeply fearful of giving anything up. So this white knuckled kind of hold on, like, you know, if we give anything up, then it's all, you know, going to go to, you know, crap. Mm -hmm. I think that's what has to happen between now, what, where we're finding ourselves now, and this, you know, easy acceptance of all kinds of stories, 
all kinds of narratives and literary justice. So that's the space in between. And most of us, we're we're fresh out, you know, our work spreads, people read it, they shake our hands, they say, oh, good job. Some of us get awards for it. Some of us get promotions and then nothing changes. And so I am wondering if in the pandemic, we're going to see a retreat from some of the diverse narratives we've seen on page and screen, because publishers are going to not have as much money. And same thing with Hollywood. And, you know, last hired, first fired. I I just wonder, I hope I'm wrong, Mm -hmm. but nothing in the past, nothing gives confidence that this time will be different. And nothing unfolding right now under a Trump presidency shows that anything will be different. I'm willing to be surprised, but I think many of us are dismayed, disillusioned, and pretty sad. So I'm sadder now than I was a year ago when the book came out. And I think I would have written a different book <laughs> hmm. if, if, you know, and I, that's where I am on May uh, 8th, 2020. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we're all feeling the toll of a number of things. Uh, obviously the, the virus and its repercussions, public sphere right now. And then much of the news, I mean, it's almost impossible to watch the news, uh, I find, or to read the news without feeling pessimistic. Mm. But it's also interesting that in, in the year since you first released this book or since people started to be able to read this and purchase it. I think, as you said, you may have written a different book, but you're probably going to, I hope, write a different book. Probably, <laughs> I hope I hope not so pessimistic as, as you sort of indicated today, but <laughs> but also I don't think there's any cause for, you know, writing a, a ridiculously optimistic book in the face of uh, some really serious challenges. But yeah, I mean, I think at the very least, the more people that read The Dark Fantastic and that are inspired by that can at least look at the world of media and the world of children's literature and young adult literature, but also more broadly, the transmedia sort of universe that's out there and think more critically, which is a good step, even if it's a relatively small step in in the grand scheme of things, right? It gives us just one more tool in our toolbox to be able to think about the representation and maybe work our way towards that future that I think a lot of us do want to see and are, you know, trying in some way. Are you right now working on or thinking about uh, the next book? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for (laughs) asking. I'm excited about this next book. I'm hoping to perhaps send it to the same people who gave you the Dark Fantastic. Um, The working title is The Shadow Book, Reading Slavery, Fugitivity, and Freedom in Children's Literature and Media. So what I want to do is I want to take the idea of sort of what slavery did to um, this collective imagination that I talked about and theorized in the Dark Dark Fantastic, because I think what I walked away from writing The Dark Fantastic with was that there must be a reason why Black children, teens, and young adults aren't accepted in these um, liberatory and agentive roles. It's like why they're not accepted as heroes, heroines, love interests. And I really do think that, as with all things, you know, when it comes to race in the United States, even, you know, for non-Black folks, you know, slavery and colonialism are indexed there somehow that we can't, you know, that something happened in the collective imagination where we just can't imagine sort of freedom, you know, on the page or, you know, a character being narratively free. So I'm working my way through that. I've actually been one of the people studying slavery and children's literature for more than a decade. So I'm part of Teaching Tolerance's Hard History Tax Task Force. So I've done a lot of work around this, spoken about it. I have a couple of academic publications around it already. And so it's time for the full book. I don't think it's going to be as popular as The Dark Fantastic with a tagline like from Harry Potter to the <laughs> Hunger Games, which was the press's idea, right? Like originally I had a really boring title, subtitle, so they made it, you know, more lively. But um, yeah, I'm really excited about that work and sort of thinking through how kids in this country first start learning about who Black people are, not just seeing a Black person at the supermarket or something, but like where do you first learn about not only us, but about our place in history. And one of the things I've argued elsewhere is that it's through children's books. It's not actually in history class Mm -hmm. that you first learn about the fact that this nation once was a slaveholding nation, right? And um, a lot of the 
founding discoursed about that. It's actually in a children's book. Normally, people are given some children's book about Harriet Tubman or Fre Frederick Douglass during Black History Month, and they're six years old or seven years old. And sometimes they go home and they ask questions that their parents may not be equipped to answer. And then by the time they do get to history in upper elementary, middle and high school, they're already starting to form some ideas about the past and about race in the past. And so, yeah, I'm going in a different direction. I thought I would write a sequel to the Dark Fantastic, write something called the Black Fantastic, right? Just capitalize on it. <laughs> but I think I'm going to let some of the millennial and Generation Z scholars who actually grew up in the new millennium, I was grown by the time 2000 came along, but they grew up with this internet and some of you know these properties. I'm going to, they're coming out with some really exciting projects at the uh, master's thesis and dissertation stage and early career stage. Mm -hmm. I want to read some of that work. And then if there is any interest, maybe I'll circle back round to the dark fantastic. I'm also working on my first novel. I have an agent, a literary agent, Brooke Sherman, and um, I've um, done one rewrite and I am hard at work. And hopefully we can get that out under submission sometime this summer or fall. I'm really hoping that, you know, I'm about 90% done with all the changes he wants. So nice. Yeah, yeah that's exciting. What yeah. kind of what kind of uh, genre is it like? It's I assume it's sort of fantasy, but what kind of thing is it? Yeah, it's black American fantasy. So I am trying to engage in some of the world building I talked about in the dark fantastic, but actually using my own culture and our myths. And, you know, I originally tried to write away slavery, you know, because I've been trying to work on this book for a, a long time. I won't even tell your listeners how long, <laughs> but, um, I um, wanted to actually think about the role of trauma, the role of enslavement, and really in original fiction do some of what I did in my long ago ill-fated Harry Potter fan fiction. So I'm asking hmm. some of the same questions. And yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with it and thinking about the characters and can you write high fantasy or a fairy tale or folk tale with, you know, regular schmegular black folks from Detroit. I'm having a good time. So we'll see if anybody reads it or enjoys it, but I'm having I'm having fun writing it. <laughs> cool. No, that sounds great. It's exciting to it's exciting to hear about both of those different projects and uh, and Ebony, I really appreciate you talking to me today about the Dark Fantastic. Like I said, it was a great read in a number of different ways and I think it's it's especially important that you're doing this kind of work and that you're also participating as a creator, as an academic, uh, and as someone who's going to affect, I think, a lot of people, whether that's children who end up reading sort of uh, the literature that might have been inspired by this or whether it's academic work and all the people in between. So, yeah, it's exciting. And despite uh, sort of pessimistic times, I'm very happy to speak to you about this. And I could, I could go on forever, but I'll, I'll have to <laughs> stop myself. But Ebony, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And let me just say this, I will end on a note of hope. This conversation that we've been having is, you know, is indicative of that hope, right? So mm -hmm. like, I just really thank you for having me on your podcast and uh, just to talk about the Dark Fantastic and all of these things. So thanks for listening. Thank you as always for listening to and supporting This Is Not A Pipe podcast. I would love to hear what people are thinking. If you want to send me a message or send me a note through tinapp.org where you can see what other episodes are there and what other book recommendations people have left. Uh, I really do appreciate it when people can share this stuff and uh, yeah, weigh in in whatever way you can. I want to thank Ebony and everyone else I've been able to talk to this year. I have one more episode and then I'll go for a brief hiatus in the summer and get back in the fall. I already have some great interviews lined up. I look forward to sharing them with you. Our last interview of the season is with Kevin Gannon, whose book Radical Hope, A Teaching Manifesto was a really inspiring read for me and a lot of other people and also a nice bookend to the season I thought. This year in August I started with Kathleen Fitzpatrick's Generous Thinking which is very much about the state of education. It is unbelievable to think about how things have changed since that August interview but I thought I would bookend it with a discussion of pedagogy and the state of higher ed. I hope you'll join me for that and I hope everyone is doing as best as they possibly can be under these circumstances. I hope you're healthy and able to engage in meaningful discussions, even if that means virtual. Until next time, I'm Chris Richardson. Cheers.